Greetings Iron Sharks and Fencers. So I was asked to make a couple videos, this one being about attacking and defending structure. So starting at the bottom, we have three main pieces of footwork we can use to cover distance and strike. As you progress, there are more you can work with. The first being the passing step, where our back foot passes the front. It's found in the first lines of the tzeto. If you will show art, you go left and right with hewing, and left with right is how you most strongly fence. This allows inherent hip rotation to your cut and covers a lot of distance. We want to rotate our front foot at some point during the cut to keep both our feet pointed different directions, as well as not step across the center line and always have space between our legs. We can train that by putting something on the ground or using a floor pattern. We also need to make sure we have our front knee and toe pointed forwards or out and not have our knee pointed in a different direction. It should be right over our heel or foot. Having it bent to one side can cause extra strain, injury, makes follow-up passing harder, and exposes the back of our leg to sword cuts. We get to clearly see in the sources the knees and toes are pointed forwards or even outwards. It often takes new students months to have a strong knee position fully ingrained, and they need to look down after stepping to be aware of it happening. The next step is a simple advancing step, where both feet move forwards, but unlike a regular advance, we want to actually power our step. The back foot will propel our front foot and then follow behind, landing back in our combat stance. Similar to a lunge, but our back foot follows, and it could also turn into a spring. All the structural elements stay the same, except there is not inherent hip rotation. Depending on the purpose of the cut, we may need to square our shoulders and hips to our partner and rotate as we step. We finally have the lunge, a very fast and powerful step, and every fencer should be developing their lunge over their lifetime. It is the hardest step out of these to do well, but perhaps has the fastest hip potential. You have your back leg loaded like a spring and propel your front foot as it kicks out, keeping your shoulders over your hips and not overly leaning. It can also be done as deep or as shallow as you need it for any given context. When striking, we want to extend our arms to use our skeletal structure and not muscle strength. With bent arms, it becomes quite easy to parry and break someone's structure and control their sword. This test can be done quite easily. Go! Okay. And now, Hudnas, bend your arms, and same thing. Your muscle strength. Okay. Yeah. Again, All right, now use straight arms. Use your skeletal strength to make sure. By the end of the cut, we want to see a V between our thumb and finger. This means we're using a handshake grip and can easily extend the sword to our opponent. A hammer grip means we have to hyperextend our wrist in order to point the tip at the opponent. We want straight wrists so we can put force and energy into our opponent's sword and have reduced chance of injury and tendon strain on ourselves. When actually striking, we want to generally have the safety idea in mind that we cross the center line in our attacks. If two people cut straight down at each other, then they will both hit each other. This is one reason why in most systems the default cuts are the diagonal cut lines. A simple way to ingrain this is to have a target with arms at roughly shoulder level and spend time cutting trying to maintain all the footwork structure described, as well as practicing edge alignment and 45 degree diagonal cuts. When cutting, we want our hand in the opposite opening of where we're hitting. This means our cut is keeping us safe, so blade on one side and hands on the other. And the same goes for undercuts. Many people will make undercuts with bent arms and hands close to their head. This can hit someone, but doesn't retain the stability and safety of arms straight, hands in the opposite opening, above your head. Thwart cuts can be practiced getting the hands to the opposite opening, and cuts are always stronger when connected to the body, meaning that they're not extended and overreaching, but have our hands in line with each shoulder and our belly button pointing into the middle of the handle. And this can be practiced with one or two hands, different swords, footwork, 
and eventually solo cutting and pairing patterns. Now this video will only cover what is referred to in the title as basic pairing. Depending on location, it can be called your plow or crown parry as well. All of our structure stays the same from cutting, but there ends up being some important choices that the person pairing has to make. First, we do want to parry with the strong half of our blade and use the edge. The edge is stronger than the flat, but also it is in line with our wrist most of the time, and we want to use our wrist connected to our arm to parry and not bend our wrists into weak positions. Our level 1 parry is passing backwards which rotates our hips and body so we get our edge on their sword. We have our arms straight and use skeletal structure and make a wall with the sword. The sword pointed directly upwards and not sloped. Sloping the parry has higher failure rate. Now the reason for the sword pointed up to begin with is how the angle of the swords affect the parry. Having two obtuse and acute angles in your parry allows a faster repost with a thrust. However, this also gives the opponent an easier chance getting your weak and breaking through, causing the parry to fail. The closer the angles get to 90 degrees, the stronger and more guaranteed the parry is, but a counter thrust becomes slower. Experiment and feel the difference. And to parry the undercut, simply maintain the structure and lower your hands, and they can be added into many drills like 4 parries, then 4 cuts. Now there is also a more advanced way to make a basic parry. When our arms are straight, they lose all the potential energy of extending them. If we parry with our arms bent 90 degrees, then they are in charged positions and are ready to shoot forwards with our counter attack or riposte. Because we lose the structure of our skeleton, we have to be more conscious of rotating our hip and body to have our belly button pointed towards the incoming attack and parry with the strong of the blade. But this parry then allows us to use our fastest limbs, our arms, in our counter attack. And with this parry, you can then set up some more advanced parry repose combinations, and you can more quickly parry either side of you. And a general rule with all these basic parries is you don't want to bring your hands over your shoulders. Now there are still other ways to affect how a parry is done, like having our tip pointed further to the outside and away from the opponent, but this is enough for today. Thanks for watching. Keep studying, keep practicing.